At the Queen's Museum, we're involved in a lot of art that has a kind of social agenda. And that's a lot of what we've been talking about up here. But there's this kind of question of how do you make it effective and how can you tell if it is effective? And so it's all, it's great. And I think the Fundred project is amazing, but it hasn't actually solved any environmental problems in New Orleans yet. And there's, you know, and I believe me, I'm a huge fan of Melchin, and we participated in that project and we collected thousands of those fabulous. So there's a question of whether the process itself has a certain kind of value. And then there's this question of instrumentalization also. So if you are saying it has a value, if it has an environmental effect, you have to say that, you know, that has, that that's intertwined with its value as an artwork. There's not the aesthetic separated from the instrumental, that the two mutually reinforce each other. So let me just give one example of the kind of thing we're doing at the Queen's Museum. We have a project which is called the New New Yorkers Project. It's a collaboration with the public library system in Queens. As Nancy said, it's a super diverse place. There are 138 languages spoken in Queens. So you can take Photoshop 1, Photoshop 2, and Dreamweaver in Mandarin at the Queen's Museum and build your website in Mandarin. You know, immigrants don't always have to be learning English. We are, are teaching English as a second language as well, but that doesn't have to be the only thing you do for an immigrant community. So over and over again, we've taught these courses. These are courses in a lot of them very tech-oriented, a DJ course, you know, or digital sound design in Spanish. I met a woman recently who had taken 12 photography courses at the Queen's Museum in Spanish, speaks very little English, but spoke a lot better English after she had taken those 12 courses in Spanish because she was working at a non-Spanish speaking institution. You had, to, you had to communicate. Everybody had to get an email address to participate in these projects. So we've done this. Hundreds of people have gone through these programs. Thousands of people have gone through these programs. Our educators evaluate their process on the basis of something called uh, collaborative action research. And collaborative action research is a process-based evaluation technique in which people set goals for what they're trying to teach they then see if they are teaching, if they're reaching those goals during the process of the course. All the teachers get together periodically and collaboratively discuss the process. And then at the end of each course, they do a kind of a self-evaluation. So it's a way to make your course better as you are teaching the course and a way to understand what other people are teaching at the museum. So course after course after course, we've gotten these results. And these results are you know, uh, we found more independent action or more people in that course are getting outside of their language ghetto. You know, they're not just in the Urdu speaking part of Jackson Heights. We then did the meta research, which was to look at the collection of all the different research that we'd done. And we said, what are the trends? And some of the trends were exactly those things, uh, independence, uh, getting outside of your particular. And then we tried to associate that with social science research that says immigrant groups in, in urban areas that work outside of their language group are more likely to be employed, have a higher you know, educational attainment, et cetera. So you, you can actually point to specific social goods that you think are being created by that particular. So in order to do that, one of the things that we have to do is to be disciplinary and be multidisciplinary and have experts from different fields working together. One of my pet peeves is that I think a lot of artists want to do social action, but they haven't been trained in social action. And there are people who know how to do that stuff called community organizers, for example. And we have community organizers on our staff. And we've had staff members who have gone for training in community organizing because they've been trying to do things that community organizers do, but they don't know how to do it. We have three art therapists with degrees in art therapy on our staff because it's not just good enough to open your door to special needs groups. You should have an art therapist who knows how to make a meaningful experience for an autistic kid, greeting that kid and understanding the specific nature of their diagnosis when they enter. So one of the things we've done to combine this is then a, an art project, an off-site art project. I'll just talk about that. An artist named Tanya Bergera Cuban artist, came up, uh, moved to Corona, and has done a project that, which is in its second year now. It's called Immigrant Movement. And the idea is to see how an art project, which takes the form in a way of a community center and an immigrant services organization, could have an effect on the discourse around immigration in Corona. So one of the things that's been happening is then those multi 
multilingual classes have been meeting at Immigrant Movement. So Immigrant Movement is a place. It's a place on Roosevelt Avenue in Corona. You go there right now, I'm sure that there's something going on there. Every night of the week, there are uh, legal services, there are English classes, there's exercise classes, there's all these sort of things that the community members have told us that they want in their community. But it's all kind of research for Tanya at the same time in terms of you know, creating a platform which, from which she can understand immigrant action and immigrant political action in the context of a Spanish-speaking community in, in New York City. She's living there. She lived with three immigrant families in a small apartment on the minimum wage for the first year of the project, which got ridiculed somehow in the New York Times, unbelievably, right? That I felt that was in a really incredibly in-depth and sincere way to do her research for the project. It's, it's a project that she thinks will take five to seven years. I think some of the most significant of the projects that we discuss, Fundred or what Royal Eucalys is doing or what Mary's doing, these are multi-year projects. These are not something that come and go. And I think that that's one of the, we talk about sustainability. To create sustainable art projects that actually have some kind of a social meaning where you can actually begin to understand what the social meaning is takes a long time. So I don't know, those are some scattered thoughts. But if you're going to talk about political art, and if you're going to talk about politics, you have to start to talk about political, you know, true real world political meaning. And I think, a, you know, a lot of the art projects we're talking about are, are beginning to understand that, but just I think we're still at the very beginning stage. So that's why, in a way, I would challenge the post-disciplinary or extra-disciplinary. I think a lot of the proven track record uh, ways of dealing with these issues are within disciplines. That's what I'm saying.